This is the Voyage Report podcast, where you get the scoop on travel. Now, the editor-in-chief of the Voyage Report, Mark Albert. Greetings, fellow travelers, and welcome. Today, we're coming to you from North America's largest travel show, the 2018 New York Times Travel Show at the Javits Center in Manhattan. So many tips and tricks on display here, and we're going to focus on award miles. Who doesn't want to fly and stay for free? Joining us today is Ari Charlstein, co-founder and president of Award Magic. Ari, welcome to the Voyage Report podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So first, tell us a little bit about your company. Yeah, we are Award Magic. We are a points and miles booking service. Um, and as you may or may not know, and as many of the listeners uh, here might know, uh, airlines making it increasingly difficult to actually get value out of your points and miles. Uh, they've added many restrictions, both in earning miles and how to redeem them, routing restrictions and the like. Uh, they've also raised the award prices uh, probably close to 100% over the last five to 10 years. Um, and so it's for the average consumer, it's really, really, really difficult to get any value out of it. And the, the biggest thing we hear, especially at shows like the New York Times Travel Show is, why would I need a company like you? My miles are useless. I hate miles and points. I stop collecting them because I can't get anywhere with them. And it really kills us to hear things like that because there is so much potential value um, that you can get out of it. And if you don't want to do it yourself, obviously, that's what guys like us are here for. Basically, you're a concierge. You help people get the most out of their miles. Absolutely right. So people will come to us and they'll tell us how many miles they have. They'll tell us where and when they want to go. And they can have five different programs they have miles with, different credit cards and airlines. And we do everything else. They don't have to deal with any airlines, any credit card companies. They don't have to be given misinformation, deal with agents who don't speak English, none of that. Uh, they come to us, give us that information. We will then find the award space. We will ensure that you only ever pay the absolute lowest possible mileage level, which is very tough, especially these days. Uh, we will communicate with the airlines uh, and the credit cards on your behalf. We'll initiate any of those transfers if necessary from airline, uh, from, from credit card to airline, and we will obviously book the ticket for you. Um, full stop, one stop shop, all for a great low price of 179 bucks. So $179 per trip or per transaction or per, per trip, person? Per, per trip per person, yep, per booking per person. And that includes everything. Uh, and obviously some people might uh, gasp at a price tag that high for something they can do their, their themselves, and, and that's absolutely true. Um, but I like to equate it to, uh, maybe not an exact example, but if I was arrested wrongfully for a murder I didn't commit, I have every legal right to defend myself in court, right? But I'd go to jail because I don't know the law like a lawyer does. So I would be smart to pay a lawyer to prove my innocence. Uh, much like this, anybody can do this. I don't have any special magic wand, but what I do have is 10 years of real world experience dealing with these airlines, understanding the ins and outs of these mileage programs, and really making the customer's needs come first. Um, I joke that I have a PhD in miles and points because I really think I spent more time learning this stuff than I did getting a bachelor's degree. Well, I was just going to say, you describe yourself and your co-founder on your website as, quote, among the most talented and experienced miles and points experts in the industry, end quote. Which begs the question, how in the world did you get started in this? We were talking, you've got a degree in broadcast journalism. How do you wake up one day and say, I can know more about miles than anyone else? Um, well, I would, I would question anybody who's an expert in any field that tells you that their journey started by saying, I could know more about my topic than anybody else in the world. That certainly was not my case. Um, I, I was a student, uh, active in a, in a student group at my college campus, uh, and the individual who ran the group um, was not particularly well off, um, and he and his family were from Australia. And every summer, he and his family went business class to visit their family in Australia. And one year I just said, listen, I know this is none of my business, but you are poor. How on God's green earth can you possibly be doing this? I mean, this is like $30,000 a year. That's more than half of what you probably make on flights. He said, oh, we don't pay, it's all points. And I'm thinking in my head, are you kidding me? These points that, you know, ever since I was a kid, my mom like quote unquote wasted on taking me to Colorado to go skiing. I could have been going to Australian business class. Um, and so, that triggered a tsunami of change in my life, of information flooding in. Um, I spent, without exaggeration, probably four or five hours a day for the next 12 to 18 months reading every blog and forum and everything I could get my hands on. I probably went through tens of thousands of posts um, on several forums and I realized that there was a lot more information out there that most people knew and I considered myself and my family pretty smart and savvy and none of us knew any of this. 
Um, and so my first redemption ever was paying for my, at the time, girlfriend, now wife, to join me on our study abroad program in Italy. Two months after we got back, we took our first around the world business class trip uh, with stops in um, uh, Japan and, and Thailand and Cambodia and Switzerland and Portugal. Uh, and we paid, at the time, 90,000 miles round trip plus maybe 150 bucks. And we were living like kings on a budget of very, very, very poor college students. Um, and after that, I said, that's it. Like, people need to know that this exists. And that was it. Gosh, I think these days 90,000 may get you three quarters of one way <laughs> to Sydney, Australia or something, and that's it. Um, and listeners, we want to let you know we've invited Ariane as our guest because we thought you'd really enjoy hearing some of his great advice. This is not a sponsored podcast. We do want to let you know there are other award booking services, Points Pros, Book Your Award, Juicy Miles, Miles Concierge, many others. But Ari is the only one here at the New York Times Travel Show. So we're so grateful you could be on our podcast today. That is uh, true. And I never want to say I have a monopoly. People ask me that all the time. I'm very good friends with at least two or three of those guys you just mentioned. And I love them to death. Uh, and thank God there's enough business for everybody. So I don't want anybody to think they have to come and check my website out or service. But thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's the disclaimer. Uh, now, your homepage, um, when you go to your homepage, what do you hope that visitors will see? What is the first thing you want them to realize? Well, I'm hoping that the first thing they realize is that they're in good hands, that they don't have to go anywhere else, and that all of the headache and stress and struggle that they've dealt with for years, getting value out of their own points on their own or trying to, is a thing of the past. Um, so on our homepage, we don't have a bunch of text. We don't have a bunch of uh, big messaging of how great we are. We just have a really cool little video of clouds flying by you and the text, click here to book your award or begin your award booking. And, and that's it. And yeah, further down, we explain what we do and we have a cool little ticker of how many miles we've actually spent for our clients. But at the end of the day, we just want you to know you're safe and the struggle is real and we get it and you don't have to worry anymore. So now a lot of people, when they think of award miles, they think of redeeming for free airline tickets. But there's a whole other world out there of things they can redeem for, right? Yes and no. So on, on, on the surface, absolutely. You can redeem for anything from a, a, a toaster to a new uh, golf club to, uh, uh, hey, if you have enough points, you could probably even redeem for a new Mercedes. Um, a lot of the airlines obviously push you towards their partners like hotels and car rentals. Um, but they, at the end of the day, I don't think anybody in the po points, excuse me, I don't think anybody in the points and miles industry would ever, ever, ever recommend using points for anything other than flights. And that is because cents per mile or whatever, you feel as though it's not as good as of a value as redeeming that business class trip to Australia. Well, absolutely. I mean, at that point, you're earning, other than the bonuses, you're earning anywhere between one and five cents per dollar spent, or one point per one to five points per dollar spent on your spending on your credit card. So you're you're not earning that many points unless you're spending a lot of money. Even at five points per dollar, you know, it's not a it's not huge. So for you to then redeem those back to the airlines for a penny or less when redeeming for something like a toaster, that's that's sacrilegious as far as I'm concerned. When I redeem for international business and first class tickets, the valuation on a strict value of dollar to how much that ticket was worth that I'm getting out of my points, it's close to six, seven, eight cents per point. Now, is that a fair valuation? Because would I ever actually pay that retail price? No, um, but compared to the value of what I'd otherwise be getting, I mean, it's a no-brainer. There are some airlines that Delta comes to mind that have recently rolled out other redemptions in their lounges uh, for Delta Sky Club. Uh, so let's say a $15 glass of champagne you can redeem 15,000 miles. You would never do that, right? Because that's one cent per mile. And not only would I never do that, but I hope that starting today, nobody ever who's ever listened to this podcast ever does that ever, ever, ever. Not just because I said it, but little known fact, and this is true, a kitten dies every time somebody does that. That's great to know. And our listeners never want to kill the kittens. Right. We love kittens. Everybody loves kittens. Everybody loves kittens. So we don't want to, uh, we, we don't want to do that. Uh, let's talk about the evolution of miles over the last uh, four or five years. Um, you know, since the re uh, initiation of award travel programs, you generally earn one redeemable award mile uh, for each mile flown. And now that's changed, uh, so-called button seat miles. Now though, uh, we've recently seen almost all the major American carriers say, you know what, 
you only redeem a mile for every dollar spent on the fare, not even the taxes, the add-ons, the extra fees, um, or, or whatnot. This impacts the traveler a lot, doesn't it? Oh my God, yes. I mean, we used to have a huge percentage of our clients were, were able to use our service because they had earned so many miles flying. And now that number has been cut, not the number of our clients, but the number of miles they're earning uh, by up to 75%. Um, you know, you look at a lot of these, ba and I'm not talking about basic economy, which is the newest, craziest thing in the airline industry, um, but a standard economy ticket with a lot of these airlines is earning 25% of your flown miles. So you went from, let's say you're, you're a, a business traveler and you're, you're flying or you used to be able to fly and earn top level status with 100,000 flown miles. That mileage flown was enough to get you a business class ticket to Europe. Now that mileage flown is only enough for a one way or not even. And that is absolutely crazy to me. Now, these guys are running a business and, and on one hand I do get it, right? They're, they're only going to reward you for the money you're actually putting in. Um, as a consumer, I don't like it obviously, but I, I can't say I blame them, um, but I can say I'm very frustrated and, and uh, it's definitely an issue. What gets a lot of people is that at the same time the airlines have drastically scaled back, as you said, by 50, 60, 70 percent, the number of miles you earn for each ticket, they've also increased the number of miles it takes to redeem a ticket. So you're almost sort of getting it at both ends here. You're, you're earning fewer miles and yet you need more to redeem for that ticket that once cost the 25,000 miles uh, per ticket, now it may be 35 or 40. I don't know if you spoke to my wife before this of knowing how to get my blood boiling. I don't want to break any of your equipment here, so I'm not going to try and get too upset about this. Uh, but yes, it is, it is really, really, really bad and it's really upsetting and it's very, very frustrating. Um, and it's beyond that, right? At a time when airlines are saving more money than ever on fuel prices, they're increasing the amount of money they're charging for fuel surcharges. At a time where they're making you earn less and less miles, they're charging more and more for mileage tickets. The miles and points aspect of the airlines is where most of them are making more money than any other aspect of their business. There these ancillary fees of check bags, yeah, they make millions and millions or billions on that, but miles and points are a currency that they are creating and producing and then basically stealing back at pennies on the dollar. Uh, and with the exception of people like me and other travel hackers and my clients and the clients of those other companies you mentioned, very few people are getting the leg up on, on the airlines and we are really being taken advantage of by the man. Uh, and it's, it sucks. There's no other way to put it. It's, it's the worst. Listeners, if you stay tuned, we'll be checking uh, Ari's blood pressure here in a moment just to see uh, how high it has spiked uh, when I ask that, that question, so, so stay tuned. Um, we are uh, chatting with Ari Charlstein, co-founder and president of Award Magic. You can follow him on Twitter at Award Magic as well as on Facebook and they're on Instagram. Uh, and Ari, am, am I correct, you have a higher end company as well, don't you? Absolutely, so Award Magic is our, what I'll call standard award booking service. Um, we help thousands of, of travelers. Uh, it's very simple, it's very easy to use, it's very cost effective, um, but it's not the handheld concierge style service that some people want uh, or need or, or, or are expecting. Um, and as a result, we have a higher end service called First Class and Beyond. Um, you don't really, we don't really have much of a social media presence. It's more of really a, a tailored, uh, tailored company, but you can find us at firstclassandbeyond.com, all spelled out, no letters, no, spa no, no numbers, no spaces. Um, and there what we're doing is we're giving you 24-7 access. You've got a cell phone number that you can text at 2 in the morning with questions or issues about your current trip that you're on, about a trip you're taking, about uh, an upcoming trip, about a passion, whatever the issue is, any, any hour, any time of day, you can call, text, or email. And that's very different from Award Magic or from many of these other booking companies um, where we are trying to save our money because we're not charging a lot of money. So we need to save our time and resources. And as a result, everything is done by email. But we understood that most people, not most, but there are definitely people out there who are willing to pay a premium for that higher level of service. And that's where First Class and Beyond came into being. I'm sure your wife loves to text at 2 in the morning. Thank God it doesn't happen often, but uh, she is not a fan, no. <laughs> she is when you guys are flying business class around the world, though. Um, is it, do you think, and I think I know the answer, but do you think it's getting easier or harder uh, to redeem miles for trips or for things we really care about? Is it getting harder? Um, 
I would say for the average consumer, absolutely. Um, the average consumer, the, the airlines and the credit cards make it make it much more difficult to get real value. Now, the question wasn't, is it harder to get more value? The question was, is it harder or easier to actually use the points? So to answer the actual question, yes, it is much easier because the airlines and the credit cards give you a lot more options on how to redeem points for these trips. Now, they charge more points, they give less value, they, they might offer more restrictions on these, on these um, redemption options, um, but they do make it easy. So for example, American Express, Chase, Citibank, all of these transferable points currencies that, that give crazy good value when you're transferring to their airline partners, they have tools on their own websites whereby at a fixed value of usually one to one and a half cents a piece, you can book almost like you're on Expedia. It's, it's very nice looking, it's very easy to use, user friendly, um, but you're, you're not getting that great value. So for that you know, $5,000 ticket that you want to book, you're spending three, four, five hundred thousand points. Now, it was very easy, but it's not the best value. So to answer a follow-up question of is it, easier to get, is it easier or harder to get good value, the answer is absolutely not. Because they make it so easy to get not good value, clients are less likely to get the good value. So when a credit card company, and we've seen this a lot with these premium credit cards saying if you uh, come with us, we'll let you redeem your miles at 1.5 uh, times their value or whatnot instead of just the one, point, uh, one cent per mile. Uh, I'm thinking of the Chase Sapphire, the high-end card that a lot of millennials went through uh, in, in 2017. Is that a value or no? When they say if you redeem through our portal. So it can be, it can be. Um, the, there's no hard and fast rule. Obviously, it's a case by case thing, but as a gen, the, the broadest generalization I can make is if you are buying a domestic ticket and coach that costs less than $400, or you are flying internationally in business on a ticket that costs more than $700, uh, yeah, you are, excuse me, that costs less than $700, you are better off using the portal. So a domestic ticket and coach that costs less than 400 or an international ticket that costs less than 600, you're probably going to get better value on a coach ticket redemption getting one and a half cents per, value, per point value from the Chase portal. However, any other redemption, domestic redemptions at more than you know, five, 600 bucks, international redemptions, certainly business and first class redemptions, it's a no brainer. Those are $5,000 tickets, $4,000 tickets. It's not even, not even a question. And if you were looking to book a ticket domestically and you went on an airline's website and it said it's $200, would you never redeem miles for that $200 ticket? Would that be a bad use of miles if it's so cheap like that? So yes and no. So thanks to these, these points that, that give you value, um, it really depends on your scenario, right? If you're a college student and, and you, you don't make any money, you can't afford to go to your cousin's wedding. You can't afford to go with all of your other friends who have rich parents to go to spring break, right? Hey, $200 ticket, that means that Sapphire card that I got that's a penny and a half valuation and I got a 100,000 point sign up bonus or 50,000 point sign up bonus, like absolutely, get, get those points. For someone like me who knows that I could otherwise use those 10, 15, 20,000 points on another ticket as, you know, towards another ticket for international business and first class, yeah, I probably won't do it. But for people who have a tight budget at the time or, or just don't want to spend the money, it's not a terrible valuation, but I, I just personally wouldn't be using the points. So Ari's rule of thumb is that in general, redeeming miles for international business or first class is always going to be the best value. 100%, and when you're doing that to not go through the portal. If you're using airline miles directly, great. They have websites that for the most part are pretty good to redeem through, not always, but for the most part. But if you have these points, Chase points, City points, or Amex points specifically, do not go through the portal. Each of those credit cards offer transfer partners, for the most part at a one-to-one -one ratio. Amex has, I don't know the number off the top of my head, it's something like 18 airline transfer partners at a one-to-one -one ratio that you can transfer 100,000 Amex points to be 100,000 Singapore airline miles, let's say. Um, uh, Citibank has 12, I think, transfer partners. Cid uh, Chase has another uh, five or six. So almost every airline is a part of some transfer partner somewhere, and if not directly, then as part of a partnership. You know, the thing that really worries me <laughs> about those credit card portals, and I was just talking to a friend of mine yesterday who said he got bitten by this, 
is when you redeem miles in the portals and all of a sudden, and you alluded to this earlier, you find out you've booked a basic economy fare, which I like to call a sneaky fare because in many cases, depending on the airline, of course, you're boarding last, you don't get an advanced seat assignment, you may not be able to get overhead bin space if you're on United or American. If, if something goes wrong, you're going to be last to be reaccommodated. Is there any way to get around that, that when you're redeeming in a portal, and we know you've now told us don't do that, but if we forget what you've just said on this podcast and we do it, is there any way to get around that? I feel like you sort of get trapped. Yes and no. There are ways to get around that. Um, basic economy is obviously a, a terrible, terrible thing. <laughs> Um, the way to get around that is to see on the airline website directly whether or not that price is for a basic economy ticket. Now, it's a pain in the butt to have to go through that extra step, but that really is the only very quick and easy way um, to guarantee you know the answer to that question. Um, some of these portals, and I don't know each one specifically because this isn't an issue ever I ever personally run into, um, or you might be able to check the fare code that you've been booked into, um, but generally the, the easiest way is just if you're booking an American Airlines fare and you're like, oh, that seems really cheap, 180 bucks round trip to LA from New York. Uh, so go to AA.com, type in as if you're booking that same ticket because this Chase portal rate is nine times out of 10 the exact same. So if you see that those flights that you want and it's basically the same price and it's a basic economy fare, you know you're being booked into basic economy. So what you then want to do is you just want to keep scrolling down and eventually there'll be a more expensive option and you'll be able to tell that that's the regular fare. And does Award Magic ever book me into basic economy on any airline? No, and that's the beauty of using miles the proper way I'll call it. When you use miles directly from the airline, and in the case of these, trans, uh, these transferable points, Chase City and Amex, for example, we're never booking through them. We're booking through their airline transfer partners. And so once you've transferred out, when you redeem a mileage, a true mileage ticket for economy, it is a mileage ticket for a regular economy ticket, not basic economy. And not to go too far down the rabbit hole, but each airline has their own fare code for their own award tickets. So it's almost sort of impossible if you're booking through Delta on an award to get their basic economy, which is E. You're going to be booked into, I think it's N or something. That's exactly right. All right, uh, let's talk about the program that you think is the easiest to redeem miles on. Is there an airline or a hotel chain or something that you're just like, you know what, this is the easiest, the best, we always have good luck when we try to do this? So there are a few aspects to what makes it the best. So there is how easy is it, just from a pure user interface standpoint, for me to log on to this airline's website and book a ticket from A to B. Um, if that's the question, um, I'd probably say it's, uh, I don't know, most of the airline websites are pretty good just from a pure ease of use standpoint. Um, probably American, United would probably be my, my choice, United or American. Um, from a value perspective, how much value am I going to get from the website as opposed to having to call into the airline? Um, Alaska is probably my favorite. You can all of the potential value you can maximize on an Alaska airline ticket, and I think they are unique in the world with this. Any of the tips and tricks you want to do with any of the other airline redemptions, you almost always have to call in to get that full value. Alaska, any of the tips and tricks you want to do with maybe one exception, and they probably have closed this loophole already, you can do right on their website. And so that's very, very user friendly, and I love that. Um, as far as which airline is going to show you the most information, um, just as one example, American Airlines has One World Partners because um, they're in the One World Alliance that you can redeem your miles on. And so if I wanted to redeem my miles for a flight on Cathay Pacific, even if I magically knew that that space was available for mileage redemption, American Airlines website does not have the capability of showing any Cathay Pacific flights. So even if the space was there and I searched JFK to Hong Kong, it wouldn't say the space isn't available on this flight, it would just not show the flight. And so that is a huge negative. Um, United used to do the same thing with, uh, with Singapore Airlines, though that has since been fixed. Um, I, I think as far as, as showing the most information and showing the most streamlined routes and not showing what's called phantom award space, which is another big problem, airlines that show you the spaces available on the website, but then when you go to book it, it's not. Um, so for avoiding all of that, my, probably my personal favorite would be Aeroplan, Air Canada's frequent flyer program. And do you think that some of these plans are not more user-friendly, whether it be the Phantom Award space, whether it be the fact that you can't see the space to begin with? 
is it simply a function of they don't want you to make it easy for you, or is it a function of, look at, we don't want to invest the money to fix this technology platform? Uh, I, I think, listen, personally, I think those two go hand in hand. Um, so, yes, I do. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, we did a story at voyagereport.com last summer about a car trawler survey that found award seat availability dropped 5.4% in 2017 from the previous year, the first time uh, since 2014 that availability shrank. Are you seeing availability shrink broadly across the programs in general? As a general rule, I would say yes. Obviously, as a professional award booking service, our job is to work around that. So do, would I say that we've seen it uh, be uh, we, we've seen a decrease in the number of tickets we can book. No, I don't think so at all. I think if anything, we're increasing our closing rate uh, as we as we grow and as we you know increase our knowledge base. Because even professionals, we're learning every day. Um, so I think we're doing a better job at finding award space. But is the space there in the same number? Definitely not. Listeners, in a bit, we're going to ask Ari for his predictions for the years ahead. Will award mileage programs disappear and be discontinued by airlines, hotel chains, etc.? And we're going to ask him. So, what has been, do you think, and I'm throwing you a bit of a curveball here, what do you think has been the best find you've ever made in redeeming award points? Is there like one holy grail that you can remember that you're like, I can't believe I found this? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, you remember? Okay, great. Uh, there's two in particular. <laughs> One, in fact, I redeemed it just because I could not believe that it was allowed. Um, and I spent uh, three days flying between four countries on two continents, spending no more than 12 hours in one city, just so I could say I did this redemption. Um, and the other was just a, a program that allowed such a low-level, low-priced award that I couldn't believe it, and I, and I obviously took advantage of it. All right, we're going to pause. Before we move on, listeners, let's ask him, since he clearly remembers all the details, including what he ate on those planes, what, was, <laughs> what was the redemption amount? How many miles did you redeem for both trips? So the, the first one was about a month before uh, U.S. Airways was completely absorbed by American Airlines and their programs merged. Uh, at that time, maybe it was two months or three months before, U.S. Airways was still technically part of the Star Alliance. So they had all of their Star Alliance partners, I, I believe, was that what it was? No, it was after they had lost their Star Alliance partners. So they had no more access to Star Alliance partners, but they had access to all of American Airlines One World partners. And U.S. Airways redemption rules, redemption prices, all of it was so much better and more flexible than American Airlines. And so the redemption I made was a very straightforward U.S. to Mexico round trip in first class. And if I'm not mistaken, the award price was 60000 I believe that was the award price. Um, but the routing was hardly simple and hardly direct. Uh, and so I'm a little fuzzy, but if I remember correctly, the route, it was JFK to Mexico City was technically what I was being booked for. And it was 60,000 miles and about $80 in taxes. And I flew from JFK to Vancouver on Cathay Pacific first class. I flew from Vancouver to, no, you know what? It was the other way around. I was living in LA at the time. So I flew from LA to Vancouver. I spent like 15 hours in Vancouver. I had friends there. I flew from Vancouver to JFK in Cathay Pacific first class. I flew from JFK to Sao Paulo on TAM at the time, or LAN at the time, first class. And that was a week before they eliminated their first class. Their first class cabin was set up in a way, it was one row with four seats. It was very exclusive and I was the only one in the cabin on the flight. And it was so cool. Uh, I spent, I think it was 20 hours in Sao Paulo. And then I went from Sao Paulo to Miami. Uh, spent a day in Miami with a friend. Miami to Mexico City. That was my destination. So I spent a full day and a half in, in Mexico City. And then I went Mexico City, Phoenix, LA to get home. And that was my simple round trip between LA and Mexico City in first class for 60,000 miles. Oh my goodness, so impressive. And um, technically we don't have a time limit on this podcast, but I'm just gonna ask you to put a 30 second cap on this answer, which is how did you find the space? 
The space was very easy to find. It's just flight by flight finding the space on things like that. Um, obviously, that's what I do for a living. Um, but the, the bigger question was, how did I know that they would allow that to go through? Uh, that I can't answer, but uh, I was very happy when I did find that out. Unbelievable. So there you go. He'll do that uh, for you, right? <laughs> Not for $179, I won't. But uh, uh, we, we try and really stretch your miles to the limit uh, as close to that as possible. Now, what if somebody comes to you, Ari, and says, you know what, I've got 250,000 miles but I've either um, lost them somehow, I can't remember my password, I can't get into my account. I mean, do you have people coming to you that say, I know these miles are in there, but I can't access them? Uh, actually, we don't. I've never personally had that experience. Um, so when people come to you, they, have, they give you their password or whatever. So we actually, at the beginning, when you're filling out our form, we don't need any of your personal information. We need your name as it appears on your passport, obviously, because we're booking, booking flights. But as far as your mile information, we just need the, uh, the, the airline, so you would say my miles are with American, or they're with Delta, or they're with Chase, and you give us a number, how many miles you have. Later down the road, when we're ready to book, depending on whether we need to transfer, or whether we're going direct, you know, all of that is answered later down the road. Um, but we don't actually need any of that sensitive information up front. So let's uh, ask about buying miles. Let's say you may be short, or an airline at the end of the year says, we've got a sale, you buy miles, we'll give you 20, 30, 40% extra. Uh, should a person ever buy miles to redeem a trip? So, if the question is, as you phrased it, should anyone ever buy miles, the answer is absolutely. There are plenty of times where that makes sense. Uh, as a general rule, should anyone buy miles? No, it is a horrible deal. Um, let me qualify that answer. Uh, if you are buying miles at whatever the crazy rate they're going to charge you, three and a half cents a piece plus you know, $25 commission uh, or processing fee or whatever godforsaken number they charge. Um, no, you should not buy your full 120,000 miles at that price because you're gonna be paying almost as much if not more as the retail cost of that ticket. That said, airlines like Alaska Airlines, for example, often re uh, sell miles for a 40% discount or a 40% bonus. And in cases like that, it can absolutely make sense. Um, not for the full amount, though sometimes there as well, but certainly for a top up. If you're 10,000 miles short, yeah, you don't want to spend $300 on that because that's not a good deal, but to spend 350 bucks to get that, you know, three, four, five thousand dollar ticket that you would have otherwise not been able to afford, absolutely, that's when it's worth it to buy. In the case of Alaska, well, that was the example I was giving, um, one of the best redemptions on Alaska Airline, if you can find the space, is a first class award from the US to South Africa on Cathay Pacific. Um, and you can stop, because they allow for one-way awards with stops, you can stop in Hong Kong in both directions for as long as you want. Now that's 70,000 each way, 140,000 round trip. Now they do sell their miles at whatever crazy rate it is, but at 40% off, and given that that 70,000 number is so low, you can really get a great deal on that flight. I don't know exactly how much it works out to, and obviously it's still not free, or cheap by any imagination, but to get that ticket for first class for only whatever it might be, two, three thousand dollars, you're looking at a fifty percent saving. So, is it free? Is it cheap? No, but it's a huge savings. So the bottom line to remember is that if you're buying a mile at three, four, five cents, hopefully no airlines charging four or five cents, but three and a half for sure. They're only going to probably let you redeem it at one cent or one and a half cent, or they want to make sure they only let you redeem it at that level. Clearly, that's not a good deal. Right. Now, they're not redeeming the airlines at, at penny valuations. They're redeeming by zone or by region. Um, but at poor value, at poor redemptions, yeah, it works out to about a penny, penny and a half. Now, we've uh, recently seen Virgin America's Elevate program merge with Alaska Airlines' uh, mileage plan. What's the impact on consumers that you've seen so far on that? Any? Um, the biggest impact I'm seeing, and, and I don't know if it's directly related, though I suspect it is, um, is some of the relationships that Alaska is now severing uh, their ties with. So um, and this was a long time coming, not impacted by it, but Delta, for example, was a, was a transfer or a redemption partner that went, you know, went away. Um, I believe American Airlines um, redemptions are going away uh, at some point soon. Um, you know, so some of their partners, they're always gaining, they're always losing, but I think that was probably the biggest change, um, was a lot of those were coming and going at the same time as this Virgin partnership happened. And correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but Alaska is sort of unique among U.S. carriers. It's not in one of the big three alliances, right? It makes its own partnerships. That's correct, and it's unique 
it's not unique in that way because JetBlue is the same way, Southwest is the same way, although Southwest doesn't have the same partnerships that JetBlue in Alaska has. Um, the real unique thing about it is that it is a true mileage program that is also not in an alliance that also allows for amazing international redemptions on some really first-rate airlines that are otherwise in alliances. Uh, one of those is uh, Middle Eastern. Is it Emirates or Etihad? Which Emirates. Yep. Emirates. And they, of course, have the bling up at the front of the plane. Yes, they do. I am happy to say I have taken multiple showers at 40,000 feet thanks to my obsession with Alaska Airline Miles. You used Alaska Airline Miles for that? Absolutely. And that's first class, or is it the re who has the residence? The residence is Etihad. That is not redeemable with points of any kind unless you are willing to redeem over a million points per direction for the JFK Abu Dhabi route. But their regular first class, they call it the first class apartment, is redeemable with American airline miles, and they do have a shower on board. Now, it's not private for you. It's private for you and your 10 best friends in first class. Um, Emirates is the same way. They don't have a, a residence per se, but they do have a first class cabin. And that first class cabin has two shower spas, as they call it, with heated floors and the whole nine yards. And uh, to say it's amazing is an understatement. Oh my goodness, holy cow. Uh, you mentioned Alaska, let's stick with Alaska Airlines. Uh, they came in first for a reward seat availability in that car trawler survey uh, that we mentioned earlier. In fact, the airline that showed the most significant improvements, they said Alaska jumping from 14th place to 7th. So if you could be king for a day and you could order these significant improvements in airline mileage programs, what changes would you make? Uh, do these have to be changes they would ever agree to or can I just say anything? You're king for a day. <laughs> uh, I would have them, uh... oh man, this is a... I love this power. Uh, I mean, the biggest thing for me is number one, being able to earn a mile for every mile I fly and not have it be tied to revenue. Number two, if not revert back to the 2007 award price charts, at the very least not raise them any more past today, put a full stop on that. Um, and C, eliminate every penny from fuel surcharges. It is crazy that anybody should be paying 100,000, 150,000 miles on an award ticket um, and forget the business class. Nobody should be redeeming a coach ticket from New York to London for 600 bucks and also have $800 in taxes. I can pay for a ticket to London for less than that. So yes, I would eliminate fuel surcharges as well. You know, one of the things we're seeing beyond just the airlines increase from 25 to 30 to 35 to 40, sometimes unannounced increases, is this dynamic pricing. You know, athletic events, sporting events, uh, airline tickets themselves when you pay for cash. But for example, on Delta, I've noticed that if I go on in the morning, maybe it's 25,000. I go in the afternoon, maybe it's 22,000. I go on at night, maybe it's 30,000. Is this dynamic pricing for award mileage redemption expanding, do you think? Is it here to stay? Uh, unfortunately, I, I think it's just a matter of time. Um, that gets to our crystal ball question, which so I'll, I'll yes. hold off on that. Um, but I, I equate that to the food truck just down the street. Uh, first day here, it was uh, Friday morning, it was setup day, not very busy, subway right outside the subway, there's a food truck selling bagels and coffee or whatever. So I said, oh great, it's right here, I'm hungry, I need to get into work. I'd love a toasted everything bagel with butter. One dollar, oh my God, one dollar, what a deal. Here's my dollar, it's an amazing bagel, I was so happy. Next day, first day of the actual trade show, it's not exhibitor day, same bagel, three dollars. I said, do you not recognize me? I was here 22 hours ago and you charged me $1. They said, sorry, busy day. So, you know, at the end of the day, you're a slave to them. And, uh, you know, as best as we can, obviously, we tried to unslavify you, uh, but there's only so much we can do when our hands are really tied behind our back. And that is really rule number one as to why you should be banking your currency whenever possible with Chase City or Amex, these transferable points because when you bank all of your points with Delta, with United, with American, even with Alaska, who's great right now, you never know what'll happen. This is the only currency in the world, and points and miles are absolutely a currency. It is the only currency in the world that any economic or other expert can guarantee with 1,000% certainty that over the course of time will devalue in, in value, uh, will, be, will be devalued. Um, and that's a real big unfortunate part of this part of this industry. And so at least when you have these transferable points currencies, the good news is that 
yeah, two or three of the transfer partners might devalue, might go, you know, defunct completely, but you always have others. So listeners, if you take nothing else out of this podcast, the lesson of the day is that no matter if we're talking about airline tickets or bagels, capitalism will rule the day. <laughs> uh, let's talk about that crystal ball. This is always one of my favorite questions when we ask our guests to get out their crystal ball forecast. And of course, we're going to follow up with you in five or 10 years to, to see what your predictions, oh, if they came true, right? You'll have to find me on my private island. <laughs> uh, let's look five or 10 years down the road. How do you think award mileage and redemption programs will evolve? What do you think uh, we will see? Will any of them die off? How will they change? I am giving you the floor, Ari. Look into your crystal ball and what do you see? Ah, I see many things in the future. Boy, don't you know what my cards are saying? Uh, it's my Miss Cleo impersonation. Right on point. Um, what do I see? I, I, the number one thing, again, as much as I hate it, the, the end of the day, these guys are running a business and they are going to do everything they can to make more and more money at the expense of consumers. Um, so on a non-mileage level, we were already starting to see more seats in, in every row, more rows on every plane, <clears throat> less, in, less uh, perks, if you can even call the ability to carry your own things on a plane a perk, less perks with every ticket purchase. The, the debundling of, of tickets is absolutely in our future. Um, and unfortunately, I do, do eventually see that happening with mileage tickets. Um, I, I think I see airlines selling business class mileage tickets, just like I think I see them selling business, cla uh, uh, business class revenue tickets without any of the perks. You're not going to get the meal. You're not going to get the lounge. You'll just get the seat. Um, things like that. I, I so wait a minute. Let me get this straight. So you're saying in the future we may see 80,000 miles for that business class seat, another uh, 10,000 miles to check a bag, another 10,000 miles for the meal on the plane, another 5,000 for wine? Yes, yeah, so I don't know how far down it will go, but I, I could see something like 80,000 for a business class redemption where you get coach check bag regulation, so it's one free. Uh, you get coach food and wine policies, so you're getting one choice, not seven. You're getting one wine choice, not seven. Um, and you don't get your lounge access, or you pay 130 or 150 thousand, and uh, and then you're getting, you know, you're getting the works, you're getting the lounge, you're getting the seat, you're getting the the food, the wine, everything. Um, so yeah, I, I, unfortunately, I do see that as a reality. The other thing is, uh, I see the the um, the industry moving from region and zone based, like it used to be, to dollar based, and like that's what Delta's doing, like you were saying. Um, uh, Delta is now in, in some markets, and they're starting to test it more and more and, and ramp it up, is they're, they're doing their mileage pricing based on how popular that season is or how expensive that ticket would be. And so eventually, not only are we going to be earning miles exclusively based on how much we're paying, we're going to be redeeming miles based on exclusively how much we're paying. And while I can hope it'll be at a slightly better rate than the credit cards are doing, which is one to one and a half cents, I unfortunately the the future is grim my friend <laughs> so we are never going back to butt in seat mileage earning do you think uh, not in the US not in the next 10 years um, I think everything is cyclical I think in 20 25 years who knows what will happen um, the one saving grace is there will at least always be one or two international airlines who either are so far behind the times or just want to stay ahead of the times that there will always be one or two options so I don't think you're ever completely out of luck but that further brings my point home as to why you want to be investing, for lack of a better term, in uh, transferable point currencies. Before I let you go, what is the destination you're looking for now uh, for a really good value that you haven't yet found? Is there one destination that you just haven't been able to see, uh, see a good value to redeem and therefore you haven't? Um, I think one destination... Yeah, no, just because Antarctica, you're almost always going on a cruise and, and you're not getting good value redeeming on that part of it. Um, one area that a lot of people don't get good value on is Hawaii. Uh, most airlines charge, and just off the top of my head, I, I think it's about 50000 for redemptions. Uh, and that's all the major carriers. Um, <coughs> that's all the major carriers. Um, but what one airline is doing or two airlines are doing is either accidentally or intentionally calling Hawaii part of North America for the, the, the Continental 48, or just leaving it as the same price or just slightly higher. So as a, as a perfect example, 
I booked recently a ticket for myself to go to Hawaii, um, and we're going, we're flying on Air Canada going there and on United coming back. So it's a Star Alliance award ticket. But those two airlines, even though I'm flying on their ticket, if I were to redeem their own miles, the price would be that 50,000 level. But because I redeemed miles from Singapore Airlines to fly on the exact same flights, Air Canada and United, I'm not going to Singapore. I'm only paying 35,000 miles. Um, Korean has, I believe it's even, I think it might even be 25,000 miles It's because they call it part of the US. Um, and so there are definitely ways to get value to Hawaii, but the average consumer just doesn't know about it. And, and these airlines aren't gonna promote that. And, and they don't even know about it. If you call a United agent and say, can I redeem Singapore miles for your flight for less? They don't know the answer to that. But you do. I do, and, and our whole team of experts do, and so hopefully we can, uh, your, your readers can entrust us with their miles to, to bring them good value. All right, Charles Steen is the co-founder and president of Award Magic. You can follow him and his company on Twitter at Award Magic, as well as on Facebook and on Instagram. Ari, right, thanks very much for joining us on the Voyage Report podcast. I know you almost lost your voice, so thank you for getting through this entire 40 minute or so podcast. Thank you, and I, I apologize to all the listeners who feel like they might be listening to a, a cow chewing on hay, but uh, I promise it's, uh, it's all for good reason. We've been spreading the gospel of points and miles here at the Javits Center, and uh, I think we're really making an impact, and hopefully this helps uh, a lot more consumers as well. Well, and I talked to you two days ago, and your voice was fine, so we must assume that there have been thousands of people asking you about how they can redeem their miles for less. And, and I don't think that's an exaggeration at all. There are literally thousands of people uh, both coming to our talk and, and, and coming through our and by our booth, and it's amazing to see some of the reactions we get, and I'm just so lucky and happy and count my lucky stars every day for how blessed I am that I get to help people make their dreams come true, I get to love what I do and I get to play with points all day. It's, it's really a, a dream come true. Even though you can't redeem it for that bagel down the street. <coughs> as much as I wish I could. All right, thanks very much. Thank you. Listeners, do you think it's easy or hard to redeem your award miles? What's been your experience? Let us know by rating this podcast, giving us a review, and sharing it on social media. We have guests every week talking about travel news and trends, so be sure to subscribe to our podcast. We'd sure appreciate your review. It helps bring more awareness to our journalism and original content. And if you have an idea for our future guests on our podcast, please reach out at voyagereport.com and let us know. Thanks for joining us today. From the floor of the 2018 New York Times Travel Show in Manhattan, I'm Mark Albert. Bon voyage. You've been listening to the Voyage Report podcast. Get the scoop on travel at voyagereport.com.